Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Thai Talk with Dan. Now, three months ago, we shared a story about Mike and Max. Mike is a subscriber who has not seen his son for several years. He is currently in Thailand with his mum, and he has no way of contacting them. So in the last story we shared, he explained how he was going to come to Thailand in the not-so-distant future in search for Max. Now, before we start today's story, I will pre-warn you, it is a very long one. So sticking the kettle on and making yourself a coffee is very much advised. Also, guys, this is a very, very, very crazy story. So strap yourself in. And let's get in to today's Thailand story. Some of you may recall uh, the story that I sent Dan that he read out a few months back about how I lost contact with my son and my Thai family. As I had previously mentioned in my last email, I had no contact details for them. So my search would begin once I had arrived in the area that I had stayed before when I was with my son when he was born. Well, I thought the family owned this house, but as it turns out, they don't and never did. I had a feeling when I was staying at that house 15 years ago that something just didn't fit well, and I had a feeling that place wasn't a family home. Now... For those people watching this, but may have missed part one of my story, I lost contact with my son Max and his mum after I foolishly cancelled Facebook, which was my only method of contacting my family that live in Thailand. My ex's telephone wasn't working and I was left in the dark not knowing if my son was doing okay. So a trip to Thailand was planned and booked. I booked three nights in Bangkok, then I was off to Ubon Ratchatani in Isan to start my search for my son. Well, that was the plan anyway. My flight got to Bangkok Monday afternoon, and I went straight to a hostel and dumped my case and then went out for dinner and then back to the hostel to bed. I hardly slept a wink as people were coming and going all night. Clearly, I am not a hostile kind of person, and sharing a room isn't for me, but I'll stick it out. So taking a leaf out of Dan's book, I think to myself, how will I keep my sanity this time when I'm back in Thailand? So I decided to do some YouTube vlogging. So anyway, I'm in Bangkok, and remember all the other times I have been to Thailand and Bangkok, I have always had a Thai girlfriend to meet once I land. So due to this, I have always been somewhat screened away from walking street and alike. This time, however, I'm all alone, with nobody guiding me around. I tell the staff at the hostel, and they say I should head off to Koh San Road. So camera at the ready, I go off to explore and do some filming about cannabis shops. How on earth anyone can go to a place like Walking Street and actually stay is a joke to me, as its crazy and messed up design is a sensor overload. It's the music, it's far, far too loud, and that's not me being an old fool. I love loud music. Then on top of all that, have all the what I would call salespeople lining up and down the whole road from end to end, all shouting as nobody can hear a single thought in your own head, let alone trying to speak to each other. So I made a dash from one end to the other. Deep breath, this time camera rolling, and I found a cannabis shop, and in I go. For any of your viewers watching, if you didn't already know, is now legal in Thailand, but it's the consuming of the plant that is the issue, as it's not allowed in public, and if you smoke anywhere outside and someone makes a complaint, the popo might get called. 
So, I have my newly sourced cannabis, which I have to say is very poor quality and not even that cheap in my opinion. This walking street had an outside covered area with loads of cannabis shops and a seating area to roll and burn. Warning alert, if it's your first time smoking, then don't drink alcohol at the same time as you will 99.9% .9 be sick and vomit and truth be told, that's what the Thais want. The fine in this one place was 7,000 baht. If that's not enough to put your viewers off, I don't know what will. So, the hardened smoker I am. I have a few beers, listen to some live music, and chill for an hour, and then a taxi home. The, the drive back was interesting, as the driver was very keen to point out the no money, no honey area of where the ladies of the night hang out. He drives by, points them out to me, but I'm not interested. So home, James, please. <laughs> so day three, my last day, and I'm starting to think I should make plans to leave. But how? Fly, train, or coach? I can't make my mind up. So I go out a second night, but this time, it's off to Soy Cowboy. Soy Cowboy only had two cannabis shops, which was odd considering the other walking streets had a great deal more. But here it just had the salespeople trying to get you into the bars and the shows. I stick to my plan and go to a very nice shop and start chatting with the staff in the cannabis shop for about an hour and a half. Just as I am leaving the shop, it's all kicking off outside. And three Thai girls are fighting and four Russian men they are with. They seem to be forcing them to go with them. A Thai policeman was observing and just stood watching, doing sweet F all about what's happening. So this group of three girls and four men slowly walking and fighting each other. Now I speak enough Thai to understand that these girls have friends that don't want them to go with these four men as they are all drunk, the Thai girls included. So I keep following them, walking as close to the man whom seems to be talking uh, to who I think is the Mamasan. As she's older than the other girls and is wearing office type clothes, not sexy like the other two drunk girls that are fighting with everyone. Then it really starts to kick off as this one concerned friend really isn't happy and she's screaming at these girls not to go. She knocks a scooter and manages to catch it before it falls on the floor, then keeps repeating, Jai Yen, Jai Yen, over and over until she walks away. Then minutes later, the same girl jumps on her beast of a bike and rips it up the street at full speed. I'm still trying to earwig on the Russian and what I think is the Mamasan, but the street is too loud and it's hard to hear. The group stops walking again and the police are still around, but still doing F all. The whole time this one girl keeps looking back at me, looking petrified and scared. So I start trying to calm her down and try to find out what the hell is going on. She says that her boyfriend, which I assume is one of these four Russian men, is ugly. But I don't think she was talking about his looks. I think she was saying he is not a very nice person inside. So by now, we have reached the end of Walking Street, and the one Russian man isn't happy with me asking questions and starts to get threatening towards me. Now little does he know, I have worked in mental health services in the UK and have spent over 10 years nursing on secure wards with some truly nasty, evil and ill people that try and intimidate all the time and for some reason shouting and threatening just doesn't work on me. It's just noise to me and I block it out. This is now dragging on back and forth and I'm having other Falang whispering in my ear, just telling me to leave it, let them just go. I just can't, because since I was 13 years old, I have always stuck up against bullying 
And that's not going to change. Now I'm almost 50. So now we are at the end of the street and it's getting even more heated and the cop is stood right next to me. So I start talking to him. Now I think most Bangkok cops know some English as I have spoken to a few in the past when I've been in Thailand. But either this guy can't speak or he is just playing dumb, but I think it's the latter. I'm not a massive risk taker and four against one isn't looking good for me, especially as the cop is doing nothing to help. So thinking on my feet when I have the next load of abuse from the Russian man, I say it's fine mate. My embassy is good and strong in Thailand and if this escalates then your Russian embassy will be involved and might take you back to Russia and put a bullet in your head for running away from the war as a traitor. I wish I had been fi filming at this point, as three of the four men's faces were an absolute picture and you could see the cogs working away as they looked at each other and then they tried to pull the main aggressor away. So for a second I thought they would calm down and maybe just go back to their hotel. Unfortunately, no such luck. Even though three of the four seemed to understand that a trip to the police station might involve their embassy being notified, this still wasn't going to stop this one Russian from wanting to fight with me. So I asked to speak with the Mamasan, and this is when things go from bad to worse. As I hadn't seen her since we reached the end of Walking Street, she just seemed to vanish. Using this word Mamasan, seemed to send one of the two girls nuts. Don't have, don't have, she's screaming at me and now she's turned on me too. She then starts shouting, I'm not Mamasan, you not say that to me. I then try and explain that I was not calling her that, I was asking for the other lady who seemed to have vanished into thin air. Nothing, nothing I'm saying at this point is calming her down and I'm starting to think this is stupid of me. I didn't come to Thailand for this type of drama. So I try and apologize for the misunderstanding about using the word Mamasan, but nothing I say will stop this from escalating. So still standing my ground, the main Russian guy starts coming at me and before I know what's happening, I have managed to off balance him it's easy when I wasn't the one drunk. And then we are face to face on the ground and all I can feel is pushing on my back and being punched in the back and ribs. The tiger in me lets out its roar and I go nuts on this guy. I even tried to poke the guy's eye out and doing a Mike Tyson, I bite his ear and maybe his cheek too. I then spot out of the corner of my eye, my shoulder bag had come off and was on the floor and most of its contents, including passport and around 30 to 40,000 baht in cash was now all over the floor and I could see the Mamasan picking my stuff up. <coughs> so I managed to get off the floor and take a few steps and wouldn't you believe it, it's only when I go to get my bag that the copper finally steps in and even though they have stood and watched this man come at me, I'm the one in handcuffs and my bag, money and passport are a foot away from me and I can't do much when I'm in cuffs. Now the copper is shouting at me like I was the one that started it. Just because I had the upper hand and was winning I got blamed and arrested. It wasn't until I went for my things that everyone seemed to be picking up off the floor was when the cops did any work. But I'm the victim. I'm telling myself. So why am I the one in cuffs? The cops trying bully boy tactics too. So I put my hands together and said I am sorry in Thai, which the crowd seemed to love. The uncuffed Russian is then making fun of me being in cuffs. 
as he walks free with his blooded up face. With me still kneeling on the road with cut up knees that look like I've had a motorbike crash. I'm then frog marched to the walking street cop box with no tourist police in sight. So I'm saying nothing at this point, just sitting, thinking and looking at the CCTV screens in this room. Then in walks another cop with my bag. It had most of my stuff apart from, you can guess what was missing. That's right, passport, money, all gone. Why did it happen this night when the other two nights I had left most of my money at the hostel and my passport, but this time I had both with me and a far whack of money? I brought 52,000 baht in cash and I'd been buying cannabis at a fast rate and was making my YouTube videos about the cannabis industry. So I estimate I spent around 10 to 15,000 baht on cannabis alone and had not used any of it and had about 10 bags from different shops. The Thais don't like cannabis, so I got all that back too, which I wasn't that shocked about. The cops are still trying the bully boy tactics and I'm saying nothing apart from the good old Jai Yen. Jai Yen. So now my inner anger is slowly turning towards the cops that did nothing. But as stupid as I can be, I'm not going to push the cops in a country I clearly don't understand. In the UK, as you will know, Dan, both people in a fight get cuffed until the facts are clear. But clearly, that's not the case here. So I'm now sitting here boiling away inside after losing my passport, thinking I am screwed and losing so much money. I really need to find where my son has now gone. The cops are now saying about making a report and I'm not sure how far I should push this. So I start faking chest pains and say hospital instead, thinking cops will be nicer in front of doctors and nurses, but no. Off to Lumpini Station we go. So now I'm sitting on a bench outside the hut to the left of the main building. I assume this is a nighttime small station when all of a sudden, like Mary Poppings, this tall, beautiful, slim lady pops up out of thin air just like the Mamasan did earlier. In perfect English, she says, I'm here to help you then starts talking to the cops. I can understand basic Thai, but only when they talk slow and no background noise. It's a tonal language with too much noise. It's very hard to keep up. The lady seems sweet enough, but she's giving me bad vibes, as why on earth would such a stunning woman just appear out of thin air and start saying she's helping me? I love Thailand and its people, and they will always try and help someone in a time of stress, that's for sure. So I tell this young lady, could you please slow down as I can't keep up when you speak fast. I also ask her name and she only gives me an English nickname, like a lot of Thais do. I ask her her full and real name and she doesn't look happy and only gives her nickname again. And I can't shake this feeling that she's somehow along the lines connected back to Walking Street in some way. But the vibe just isn't right. Even after she says she's a lawyer, I still can't shake this feeling. Thailand can get in your head and make you think crazy thoughts as it's completely different to the West. Which is its appeal to me in a lot of ways. It's Buddhist faith and Jai Yen Sabai ways that make me feel at home here. Anyway, the cuffs come off and some first aid cleaning is done on my knees and an old drunk or just crazy lady is sitting on the bench opposite to me. I know crazy even when I don't speak the lingo. Due to 10 years working in mental health, you learn to read the signs. I'm not paying crazy lady any mind other than to ask if she has a cigarette, as my heart and chest did now start to race, as the thought of me being at the police station 
and dealing with about five officers, including the big captain, who was a giant compared to all the other officers in stature and rank. I put my hands together, show respect, then opened my mouth and clearly said something that he didn't like. I probably messed up my wording, so I am drawing up a sizable amount of cops outside and the lawyer lady isn't talking to me or asking anything. She's just back and forth with the cops. At this point, I'm just shutting down and thinking, what an absolute ass. Why on earth have I just gotten myself involved in other people's affairs? Call me paranoid if you like, or crazy, or even both, because at times I have had those questioning thoughts, but I have learned not to say too much and to keep my thoughts to myself. So, I'm deep in thought, trying to block out the crazy lady on the opposite bench, but keeping an eye on her at the same time. As why on earth would the cops let her hang around, causing a nuisance? My mind is flicking from, should I just ask for the hospital, as now my chest is tight and I was struggling to breathe properly. I am thinking a week on that it's bruised ribs as it still hurts to take a deep breath. And I have had a fractured ribs before, twice in fact. So that's what it is, I'm hoping. And the hospital doesn't treat you for ribs. This I know firsthand. So I'm not wasting my time and money. But I'm thinking I should speak with the UK embassy before opening my mouth about what seemed to be happening with these two girls and the Mamasan. I know if I stay and start making too many waves, I might not come off well in this situation, as I am all alone at this point. So if I start asking for an investigation, then things could get ugly. So I'm saying they couldn't speak a word of English before, and now suddenly start asking if I have been in the army. So now I'm annoyed that they can indeed speak some English. Then bold as brass, a young lad walks out of the police hut and goes over to his friends who are sitting under a tree, watching my drama unfolding in front of them. As he is walking towards his friends, he turns to me and in perfect English, are you okay, brother? <laughs> no, I'm not really. I have this lawyer that only gives nicknames and a crazy lady that keeps chirping in every so often but nobody seems to pay her any notice. The cops say something to him and he walks over and starts to take my pulse, which I understand later as to why, as he tells me it was because I had been smoking cannabis and he was worried about my heart. So now I seem to have someone that I'm getting a good vibe from, a 22-year-old called Guitar. Just been let go from the police for carrying a gun without a license. No bullets, just a pistol he was going to use or had used to threaten his boss. He and his co-workers hadn't been paid any commission for over three months. And the last time he asked the boss for his money, he got a beating for his efforts. So the gun was supposed to scare his boss into paying. The only problem is this kid's dad owns the tailoring company that makes the police uniforms and his dad called the cops on him and told them he was carrying the gun and what he was planning on using it for. Clearly, a dad trying to protect his son. Now, as he's talking to me, his friends hand over to him one backpack and one gym bag. The backpack was packed to the brim with bagged up, ready to sell packs of cannabis. So he makes a joint and we joke that we have all the cannabis, all this cannabis, and the cops are just feet away from us and can't do anything. I have reached in my mind what to do, and that's to come back in the morning after I speak with the British Embassy and change some US dollars that I had for my border crossing into Thai baht. But all I have left is 20 baht, and my phone has a smash screen and isn't working, so I couldn't even phone for a grab taxi. So I'm talking to this young man, trying to work out if this is a good person or not. Then the crazy la lady starts chirping away at me and my new friend. 
but I could tell and understand enough to know she was trying to mess with my friend's head. Only at first, it was by talking about black magic and voodoo. A lot of Thai people are super afraid about black magic, so he run up to her and fake kicked her, at the same time saying shut up in Thai. He then turns and starts to walk towards me back under the tree with our bags. He steps away from her with his back turned to her, then in a blink of an eye, she bends down to the ground beside her on the bench and picks up a four foot long solid metal bar made from steel. He is not looking and before I even have a chance to warn him, she's cracked this young man over his skull and he has hit the deck. Blood is everywhere and she's opened the back of his head up with a nasty gash about 10 centimetres long. Crazy lady went to hit him a second time as he lay on the floor not moving, so I had to go and step in and stop her, as by this time all the cops had gone inside the hut. This poor young man, had he not turned and asked me if I needed anything, he would have just walked off and been fine, and now I feel so guilty that it's all my fault, and somehow I am to blame. The cops see or hear and rush out as I'm wrestling with this old crazy lady and I'm thinking the poor kid could die and the cops are just standing around doing nothing. He was responsive and maybe the rules are to wait for an ambulance which did come quickly, thankfully, as he kept drifting off and coming back again. So I just kept talking to him letting him know not to move and just keep him responding to my questions so I could tell if he had any brain damage. So I asked this guy if he knew her as she was waiting outside the station, so had she been waiting for him? He said that he had never seen her before, but she was saying that she has the power to send him to prison using black magic. I'm trying my best to look at this kid's head, but my knees are so sore and cut up, I can't kneel down to look. Cops stood about, didn't move a muscle, and the old girl started walking away until I point this out to them, and then one follows her, but no cuffs for her. She could have killed this man, yet she walks about without a care in the world, and so do the cops. So my new friend is being looked at, and me and him now seem somewhat screwed, but at least my head isn't cut open like his is, and I'm feeling guilty. So I offer to stay with him and look after his stuff and wait with him until a family member could come to see him. He jumped at that offer quick and was more than happy for me to stay. In fact, he wouldn't let the amb ambulance crew take him without me coming too, holding on to his two bags full of cannabis. Once we arrive at the hospital, he says, I suppose you're going now. I assume he was thinking this guy has paid a small fortune on cannabis in Bangkok and has lost shed loads of money too. And now I'm holding two of his bags full of gear and other items like his two phones. Now, maybe he thought it would be my way of leveling up on my losses. The thought had crossed my mind if I was honest but I couldn't do that to a person that tried to help me and he got a crack on the head for no real reason other than to get him to shut up and stop talking to me. So it's 4am and one of his brothers comes to collect him and gives me a lift back and 500 baht so I can buy a pack of smokes. That's right, a Thai person giving a phalang money. The next day I manage to speak with the UK Embassy and I'm advised to just make a lost report for my passport and money and a few other things and just leave out the reasons why the fight happened in the first place and that the policeman just stood and watched as my things got picked up that I could have picked up myself and then not lost anything. I was strongly advised not to make a complaint about the police themselves so that's what I went back to the station to do when finally the English-speaking tourist cop said none of this would have happened 
had he been working the night before. He passed me a blank piece of paper and said, write my report. And I'm thinking to myself, that's your job, mate. And just keep repeating to him that it's all on CCTV and your officers stood and watched it all happen in front of them. I'm not about to start doing your job for you too. So I just give the passport number and amount I lost and was told to come back the next day. This is on the day I should be leaving Bangkok to go and find my son. And now I'm stuck without a passport and very little money. The dollars I had was enough to keep me going and to pay to stay in my hostel, even though I had a nice room waiting for me in Ubon, Ratchatani. I was now stuck in a city I hate. I go back the next day and I am told my passport and wallet have been found and I'm shown a photo of my money and wallet and that it had been sent to another station so I would have to go back the next day. So I do and when I arrive I am told, sorry, nothing has been found. Which then, I tell the female English-speaking officer I had already been shown a photo of it. So how can it not be found as you had it the day before and now you're telling me that you don't have it? Well, I'm not leaving until I have it in my hand. All the time saying Jai Yen to not cause a scene. So I chill and just wait and lo and behold, it reappeared without any money, then with some money, and no, it goes without saying. No, it didn't have the full amount. It had about 10 to 15,000 missing, but I got my passport, which was the main thing I was worried about. So, passport in hand and enough money to get the hell out of Bangkok and onto my Airbnb to start my search for my son. The next morning I went to the hire company to get some wheels and start mapping the area that I remember from my last trip. The first day I tried several temples and no joy but still upbeat. The next day I go in the opposite direction and I start to get small memory triggers and after about three hours of riding a scooter, I'm back at the house I stayed in with Max and family. It's changed a lot and other buildings are now surrounding it, but 100% the right house, but nobody is home. So I take the photos I have and start asking the house and shops next to it, but nobody is recognizing the photos. Well, the temple is just around the corner and Maxwell's mum would often visit. So I tried going to see the monks, but this temple was closed for some reason. So now my heart is breaking and tears are rolling and I'm a mess. I have not eaten probably since I arrived, almost a week late starting my search and now drawing a complete blank. So what to do now? The only other two places are the market and Lotus. So off I go to show the photos I have, but still nothing. I need to eat as it's 8 p.m. and I have to ride back to the hotel, but I can't leave. I just know this is the right place to start my search. It's the only place that makes sense to come back to. I had a feeling about this house, even though I had been told at the time was a family home. I didn't believe them. Something just fell off about how the family used the home. My damn spidey senses kicked in and I have now been proven right that I had been lied to about this home. Knowing I was right to think that 15 years ago does nothing to bring my son back into my life. Just having thoughts from the past confirmed was a light relief. As I am sitting and eating, I see donuts. So I stand and think, coppers like eating them. I'm going to go to the police station with photos in hand and show cops and I'm told to go back the next day. They send an officer to the house to show the owners, but they don't know any of the faces in the pics. So no joy. 
Or maybe people are saying nothing, but no more. I just know this is the area to keep searching. So I go back to the market and keep looking, but later go back to the station with two boxes of treats for them. And it's then shown that the police made a Facebook page and lots of people had been messaging, but still no joy. So I'm stood outside taking in the sight of a massive storm brewing up and is now unleashing rain like you have never seen. And I'm not riding a scooter. It took me two hours in the rain looking and it was already 10 p.m. by this time. So in no rush to leave, I'm thinking, stay in a local hotel for the night, or should I set up the hammock I had with me in the police station car park when I hear Mr. Green, we have found them, she's on the phone, now with my ex, and she will call me soon. At this point, my heart just bursts open and the tears of joy are gushing out of me like Niagara Falls. All the family are well and moved to a new area, but Maxwell is still living at the temple, which is hard to hear, but also understandable as I didn't support him. So the temple was his only option. The next evening, I see my son for the first time since I held him as a baby and life now seems to make sense again. Leaving Thailand, I left with a broken heart. Now it's time to heal and move forward with my son, Max. Now it's not a case of turn up and Max leaves with me. We have a lot of catching up to do and to get to know each other, but I know I am now where I am supposed to be. Staying in the UK not knowing would have left me hanging from a tree from depression and I couldn't let that happen. I needed my boy to make me whole again. It makes me so happy, Dan, seeing you be the father I should have been all along. But poor health and long recovery didn't help. Stay strong, stay healthy. Maxwell has already told me off for smoking. Max is a gentle soul and very caring and kind. Being a monk has done him good, but he wants to see and feel normal life away from being a teenage monk. All the best, Dan. It's only taken me about six hours to write this. Thankfully, you read quicker than I type. Kind regards, Mike and Max. <sighs> right, long story, guys. Very, very crazy story. Getting arrested, going around the cannabis shops, fighting with Russians, um, and then doing his bit all over the place to try and find his son. But luckily... They was reunited and it'd be nice, Mike, if you can give us all an update in regards to how your relationship is working out with your son. If you've spoke to your ex, is she going to come and see you uh, when you next visit Max? You know, it'd be nice to find out what the future holds for you and your boy. And I hope you can definitely have some kind of long lasting and fulfilled relationship together and for all the single guys single fathers out there i'd just like to say well done for finally um coming to thailand finding him um and hopefully reconciling with him as well so all the best mate Right guys, if you've got your own story that you wish to share on the channel and you've managed to listen to this story up to this point, then please feel free to sit down, type it out and send your email into tytalkwithdan at gmail.com. Hopefully we've got another story coming soon in a few more hours once I do all the editing, etc. Um, and then that will be me done for today. So thanks for watching, guys. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Ciao for now.